Today I'm going to show you what's inside the Ford EcoBoost engine and how it works. This engine is a 2 liter 4 cylinder engine out of a 2016 Ford Focus ST and apparently it's here because it hydro locked itself by sucking in snow through its PCV catch can. Now taking a quick look around here you can see we do have this big honking plastic intake manifold as well as a plastic valve cover. We've also got an aluminum head as well as an aluminum block with the oil filter externally located down here. Now coming around the front here you can see this is the timing cover as well as where all the accessories would be. This is the water pump. Over at the back here where the firewall would be we've got the exhaust side of the engine and this turbocharger. Now the engine does turn over. The previous owner said it ran but it ran pretty bad. First thing we're going to do is remove this air intake. Alright and now I can remove that intake. Alright next up we're going to remove the coil packs. Now we'll just pop these off. Next up I'm going to remove all the valve cover bolts. These are 8mm. Here you can see the bottom of the valve cover. Everything here is made of plastic. And here you can see the seals for the ignition coils and spark plugs. Over on this side I do like that the bolts are captive so you can't lose them as easily. And out the back here you can see we've got our cam sensors for both the intake and exhaust camshafts. And then up at the front here you can see these two holes here for the variable valve timing solid mode. Alright, taking a look under the valve cover on this side here you can see you've got the timing chain. It's still got tension on it over here. I do notice a lot of rust over on some of these cams over here but this engine was sitting for a couple of months. On this side here we've got our direct injection fuel pump which is driven off the exhaust camshaft and on the intake camshaft we have a vacuum pump that's usually going to drive things like your brake booster. Now I'm going to next remove the direct injection pump housing here. And that's the lobe there that would drive the direct injection pump. I'm going to go ahead and start on this vacuum pump. Here's the vacuum pump. Alright, once you get the bolts out of there, see if you can crack this open. And you can see how that vacuum pump works. Basically, as this camshaft here has a slot, it's going to turn this over here. And that's what's going to turn this little sweeper and bring air in and compress it. Alright, while we're here, we're going to get this water thermostat. Basically takes all the heater hoses and joins it to the crossover tube. Now this engine is direct injection only which means that they're going to inject high pressure fuel directly into the combustion chamber as opposed to in the intake which goes into the combustion chamber from before. We'll just take off this little padding. Now here you can see the fuel rail where high pressure fuel is going to enter over here and power these four injectors. There's also a sensor over here to monitor the pressure. Over here we've got the plastic thermostat housing. And there's the thermostat. It lives next to the water pump over here. Now this black thing here is an oil separator. As it ventilates the crankcase, it draws it back into the throttle body which was mounted over here on the intake. Yeah, and here's where the two knock sensors are located on this engine. Now we're going to move to the front of the engine where we have the timing chain set up. Over here we have the water pump. I'm going to go ahead and remove that. Just pop out that pulley. Alright, now let's get that water pump off. These are just 8 millimeters. Alright, let's switch to the half inch drive impact and see if we can get this bolt out. Alright, so I got something jammed in the timing chain over here. I'm going to see if I can crack this bolt loose. So since I can't get the timing cover off due to the crank bolt, I'm going to go ahead and take off as much as I can from the top end before flipping the engine over. I'm going to go ahead and remove all these 10 millimeter bolts and hold these cam caps on. These actually have separate bearings in them as opposed to just being one piece of aluminum. And the bearings themselves don't look very used out or scored out. This engine definitely still had oil even if it was mixed with water. Here's your variable valve timing. You can see it's got the dual channels here that are going to feed the two channels on the camshaft. Put oil in or reduce oil pressure when you want to phase the cam. Next I need to remove this turbocharger. I do have another video on how turbochargers work so you might want to check that out. Here you can see is where the exhaust gases are going to flow down and we've got a vacuum actuated wastegate over here. You can see this here is an oil line that comes in over here. We've got another oil line here that comes from the timing cover over here that actually feeds it the oil and then there's a waste over here at the bottom that dumps it into the sump. Now over on the intake side here you can see we've got the intake from the airbox and this goes to the intercooler. All right, now we're going to remove the oil line. And here's the other part of that oil line. That now I'm going to remove the 13 millimeter bolts that hold the turbocharger to the manifold, which is actually integrated into the head. Now I'm going to remove the turbocharger. Whoa, got a bit of weight to it. And looking at the back of that turbocharger, you can see here's the inlet for the exhaust. This here is that flex line that drains the oil 
and this is the other input line for the coolant. So turbochargers have both coolant and oil going to them. And this is the band clamp that holds the exhaust side of the turbocharger to the intake side of the turbocharger. And the two turbines live in here with a shaft in the middle that has to be cooled and lubricated. I'm gonna go ahead and turn this engine over and take apart the bottom. I do have my brother's really old pants here. I don't know why he keeps wearing these. I'm just gonna put those down there so that it can absorb any oil. Oh, there's oil. Alright, so there's a lot of oil leaking here. I got my wife's old dress. I'm gonna go ahead and clean that up. Okay, so I kept turning the engine over and I got the cams kind of stuck. Let's see if I can break this bolt free. Yeah, got it. Alright, so next up I can remove all the 8mm bolts that go around this timing cover. Alright, we're gonna go ahead and remove the timing cover now. And here's a look underneath that timing cover. You can see this area here where they've strengthened it up to hold the engine mount. Taking a look at the engine design here, you can see it's actually fairly simple. You've got your dual overhead camshafts over here at the top of the engine, a single slide over here, and another slider over here with a tensioner on it that's powered by the camshaft. We're gonna first start by removing these two tents for the timing chain tensioner. Now here's what the chain tensioner looks like. You can see it's spring-loaded over here and it's got this ratchet mechanism on it, controlled by this here. Inside of here, you can see there's a little oil filter over here. I'm going to take some of the oil, and that goes to the turbocharger. I believe this is also hydraulically assisted, because there's a bunch of oil squirting out when you push it in. All right, now I'm going to remove these timing chain guides. Doesn't show like there's any wear on that. Okay, I'm going to remove the camshaft at the bottom, and then remove this timing chain slide like this. Again, these are plastic, but it doesn't feel like there's any wear on them. And then I can remove the timing chain itself. And with that, both of my camshafts is dropped out because they were just held in by the chain. The oil pump drive's got this little slider on it with a tiny little spring over here. Oh. Alright, let's see if we can get that oil pump out of here. Ah, maybe we need to take the oil pan off next. Over here at the bottom of the engine, one thing I do like what Ford's doing is that they're using an aluminum oil pan as opposed to, say, a plastic oil pan like in the newer models. And they have a flat bottom, so when you take out this engine, when it fails, it sits nice and flat. It doesn't fall on your foot. I'm going to go ahead and remove all the 10 millimeter bolts here to hold this oil pan to the block. And I'm going to go ahead and remove that oil pan. Now taking a quick look inside of this Ford EcoBoost oil pan, you can see it is pretty reinforced and somewhat strong. I don't see any evidence of water inside of here, like the previous owner told me. So maybe water did not get enough chance to mix with oil. Here we can pop off that oil pump. You can see this is the plastic pickup tube. I don't see any debris in there or anything. Now taking a look at the bottom end of this Ford EcoBoost engine, you can see that Ford's using a balance shaft. That's because four-cylinder engines are naturally not balanced. So this is to help smooth out some of the vibration. Furthermore, I also see that they've done cross bracing over here between the main bearings, which is good because these engines do produce a lot of power and it's good to have a strengthened up bottom end as opposed to just having those bearings mounted directly to the block. All right, I'm going to go ahead and remove these 14 millimeter bolts that hold this balance shaft assembly on. You can see when the crankshaft spins this gear over here, these two balance shafts spins in opposite directions to counter the forces to reduce vibration. I'm going to continue taking off the bottom end here so we can get the crankshaft out before we flip it up to the top to get the head off. I'm going to go ahead and remove these 15 millimeter nuts here that hold this ladder frame as well as the bearings themselves on. All right, time for the big gun. Well, these better have been tight because they are main bolts for the bearings. Time for some breaker bar action now. Now we should be able to zip these nuts off. See, they look like nuts, but they're actually a bolt. All right, now that this tray is loose, I can go ahead and remove it. Here you can see the importance of having this ladder frame design. It is a lot stronger than just putting main bearing bolts over here because they support each other both up and down and side to side. The only thing is, however, this is made of aluminum. I wish they made it out of steel. It is pretty lightweight. And looking at the main bearings here, you can see they're actually in pretty good condition. They don't seem any scored up or anything, and I don't see any evidence of milk. Next up, we've got the connecting rods over here, and I'm going to remove. They're an E-Torx 12 millimeter. And I'll go ahead and pop that off. Connecting rod bearings are pretty clean. Next up, we'll remove cylinder one and cylinder four. And these connecting rod bearings are perfect as well. I don't see any issue there. That's going to remove this rear main seal over here. And now I should be able to lift out this crankshaft. 
I lost my toothbrush in one of these oil galleries. But taking a look at this crankshaft, you can see it's a standard four cylinder arrangement where you have the pistons that are opposite for each other, 180 degrees. We've also got this giant gear here that's pressed on to drive the balance shaft. Other than that, it's a pretty simple forged crankshaft, though it does feel a lot heavier than a normal four cylinder car crankshaft. That's because this engine is turbocharged and fetches a lot of power. Now we've got the bottom end apart, we're going to turn it over and take off the head. Oh, there's more mess. Now my brother's toothbrush did not fall out the bottom when I turned this engine back over. So we're going to have to take the head off to try to get it out. Now with the camshaft removed, you can see that this uses a bucket style of cam on direct valve action. Down here, there's no roller rocker arm system. But that also means you are going to manually have to do a valve adjustment when this engine gets old and worn out and these get all rattly. But this is an EcoBoost engine, so we don't expect it to last that long anyways. Now the head bolts on these are a T55 torque socket. All right, now I'm going to remove the head. And in doing so, my toothbrush popped out the bottom. So I'm going to go ahead and use that to push the pistons up the top here. All right, let's take a look at these pistons here. The one thing I notice is how much carbon is built up on these pistons. Look at those control rings, they're all full of carbon. Tons of carbon buildup. This one is not as bad. And this one's got a lot of carbon too. All right, here I've got a piece of my wife's... Uh, something rather it's pretty absorbent material so we're going to go ahead and clean off some of that oil and take a look at that oil ring so here's a look at piston number four you could tell that the carbon buildup from the top of the engine here this engine was definitely burning oil you can see some of the rings here they're not seized but they are have a lot of carbon buildup on them even the oil control ring at the bottom here has a little bit of carbon buildup on them but it's still free to move okay i can actually take this out there is a bit of carbon in here but at least they do move it's not completely clogged up and that's hence why i think the previous owner probably put a catch can on here just because of all the oil deposits that get inside of your engine especially with direct injection these engines tend to burn a lot more oil additionally the connecting rod bearings actually look pretty clean there's no evidence that any water got into them now i don't notice that the pistons have been regapped or anything there's no damage to them it doesn't seem like they hit the cylinder head so it doesn't seem to be completely hydro locked this engine probably could have been saved so here we've got all the components removed from the engine stand let's take a closer look at how they work and we're going to start at the bottom of the engine here where we have the oil pan, nothing much to it, just a cast piece of aluminum which is pretty strong and reinforced, a lot better than the new plastic ones that Ford's coming up with, and it's probably better than a stamped steel oil pan as well. Now sitting just inside of that oil pan is the oil pickup tube as well as the oil pump, so if I go ahead and take that apart here, here you can see just how that works, this is going to rotate over here, and it's got a star wheel that rotates inside of a star wheel, and that's going to create oil flow. And I don't notice any debris in here, so this engine is definitely not blown up. Now sitting just above that attached to the crankshaft is this balance shaft. I'm going to go ahead and open up this unit here. here. You can see the inner workings of this balance shaft assembly. So essentially what we got here are two shafts that are going to rotate opposite from each other using these two smaller gears over here. This large gear over here is driven by the crankshaft itself and these are going to rotate in opposite directions from the crankshaft to counter any vibrations. Inside of here you got a big steel housing and it too has its own bearings that have to get lubricated by the oil system. Now starting at the bottom of this engine block here you can see this is where the oil is going to be drawn in through that oil pump and it's going to be sent down this oil galley over here to the oil filter to get filtered out. If I take off that oil filter, it's a standard canister style oil filter which I like. Alright let's get this oil filter housing off here. Oil filter housing is pretty straightforward, oil in, oil out, and over here we've got the oil pressure switch. And on the back side here we've got an integrated oil cooler. We have coolant coming in and coming out to help cool down the engine oil at higher loads. And once that oil is done being filtered, it's going to head down here to the main oil galley that runs along the block here, which is going to send oil to the sprayers, as well as to the crankshaft bearings, which are drilled down there on this way to tap off the oil supply. In addition, off the main oil supply, you have another galley that's going to run up here to lubricate the head. Now this here is where the positive crankcase ventilation system lives. It's basically an oil separator with this baffle over here and the PCV valve over here that's going to send those vapors directly into the throttle body and back into the intake. This is kind of a weak spot because this is a direct injected engine and if any oil is not separated it's going to end up clogging up the intake. Now speaking of the air intake here you can see we've got a very simple intake. There's no tumble control valves. There's a single map sensor and a resonator over here and we've got the throttle body which is a drive-by wire unit and it's actually surprisingly clean. Wow. And this is just going to directly put boosted air into the intake. And here we we have the engine head you can see this side is the intake side each valve has its own intake port so to speak and down inside of here are where the valves live you can see there's quite a long stem before it reaches the actual valve at the bottom here furthermore this here is where your direct injectors would plug in so looking into the combustion chamber you can see these ports here 
are where fuel is going to be sprayed directly into the intake. Now you're going to have to trust me here because it's really hard to see, but these intake valves are completely clogged up with carbon and that's just a byproduct of the direct injection. It's actually a very common issue on these EcoBoost engines. Now carbon buildup is going to cause the air to be stifled as it's going down inside of the valve here and then you're going to get all kinds of performance issues. The only way to fix that is to remove the intake and walnut blast out all of that carbon and clean it up. But you're going to have to keep doing that because it's just going to keep building back carbon. Now take a look at the bottom of the cylinder head here. Again you can see just how dark and black it is just like the piston heads that we saw. Again this is an indication that maybe this engine was burning a lot of oil. Now furthermore one of the other changes Ford made for the second generation EcoBoost engine was water cooling this integrated exhaust manifold. So you'll see that there's actually two ports over here where they've drilled in a water jacket and that's to allow the air to cool down before it goes into the turbocharger. Now another change they made with the Gen 2's is they've made individual passages for each one of the four cylinders here so that they can each pump their exhaust gas directly into the turbocharger as opposed to having them all group into one. Another big issue with the EcoBoost engines is that this exhaust manifold would start to leak. Now this exhaust manifold you can see here is integrated into the turbocharger housing so you basically have to replace the entire turbocharger when this starts to leak and it loses boost pressure and causes performance issues. It's also obviously going to spill exhaust fumes down into your engine bay which isn't going to smell very good. In addition the solenoids and electronics that control this vacuum actuated waste gate here are also a weak point on these EcoBoost engines and they're not really easy to get to inside the vehicle. Now back up at the top of the head here we do have our dual overhead camshafts and they each have variable valve timing but I did notice though is that this one here had a ton of play in it. That's not good and it probably caused a lot of rattling especially on startup. Now the other camshaft over here features a special lobe that drives the high pressure fuel system. The fuel system was also not a strong point on these two liter engines especially the low pressure fuel pump in the tank it kind of conk out as well as the high pressure fuel pump might also conk out because these things have to pressurize the fuel to a really really high pressure. Here's a flaw that's affecting some of the newer EcoBoost engines. You'll see here they're actually using a semi-closed deck design where it's not completely open between the cylinder walls. That's great for strength but it's not that good for cooling. You can see in between the cylinder walls here they've dug a little trench here and cross drilled a hole between these cylinder walls here. That's good for cooling because it'll allow coolant to exchange over to the other side in this very critical location between the two hot cylinder wall. However on newer versions of this engine they've just made a little tiny trench in between here to allow that coolant crossover and then you've got your head gasket that sits on top of here. Essentially what that does is it makes a weak spot where coolant which is crossing over here can mix with your cylinder combustion and your oil and then you start blowing coolant out your exhaust and that's not good because now you basically need a new block in order to correct that issue. And that's a wrap on the Ford EcoBoost engine. Now all of the hardcore mechanical bits might actually be reliable on this engine. It's all these add-on bolts on pieces here that might cost you a pretty penny especially when the vehicle comes to high mileage. Now, unfortunately turbocharged overstressed engines are going to be around for a while until these oil companies here finally give up and we're mandated to drive skateboards. Make sure you subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one.